Welcome everyone to our virtual grand round. My name is Dr. Alan Wong. I'm president of the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. And I'm pleased to introduce our night's program, part two in our series uh, tonight of uh, optimizing comfort for individuals with IDD in the dental environment. AADMD is an organization dedicated to improving inclusive health care for persons with IDD. We highlight advocacy issues, work to collaborate with others in the healthcare team systems, and hope to change the world through education and access to care. We are delighted tonight to feature our part two part of uh, the series uh, with our team of experts who are experienced and highly qualified on the topic. Speaking on a per uh, personal note, um, I recently was hospitalized for uh, a nerve damage in my back, my uh, uh, herniated disc, and, and also was also treated for COVID for several weeks in the ICU. Coming off of that, I was pretty debilitated and I was horizontal on, in the bed for 23 out of 24 hours of the day. And had not been for occupational therapy and physical therapy, I wouldn't be able to uh, sit up and uh, talk to you right now. The value of occupational therapy and dentistry can't be under, uh, underestimated at all. So I, I'm here to testify to that, uh, to that extent. So welcome tonight. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful panel of uh, professionals and some students as well, both in dental and in occupational therapy. And uh, they'll be uh, pre uh, presenting some great information and very useful information for all of us. At the end, there'll be time for presentation of, I'm, excuse me, at the end of the presentation, there'll be time for questions and answers as well. So uh, let me introduce you to our specialists sorry, tonight. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Tona. Uh, Dr. Jan Tona is a PhD and occupational therapy uh, uh, specialist uh, at the uh, Department of Rehabilitation and Science at the University of Buffalo. She received her master's in occupational therapy and pediatric and developmental disabilities through University of Pittsburgh. She uh, then went to her PhD program in educational psychology at the University of Buffalo back in 2003. She has uh, published in many, many journals and her focus is optimizing oral health for individuals with disabilities at home and in the dental office using sensory, motor, and behavioral interventions. She has worked in the field for over three decades, of which the last two decades have been in education. She has been um, a leader in her area. Her teaching experience includes courses in pediatrics, neuroscience, evidence-based evidence practice, service delivery issues, interpersonal communication, and group process. Her doctoral dissertation and everything in the development of clinical reasoning has been tremendous. Along with uh, Dr. Tona, we have another wonderful presenter, uh, fellow colleague of the AADMD board, Dr. Melen Dion Chinkit Wells. Dr. Wells is an assistant professor at the Department of Pediatric and Community Dentistry at the School of Medicine there. Uh, she started as a dental nurse in Trinidad in the 80s and applied to Buffalo where she received her DDS, completed her GPR residency at Millard, Millard Fillmore Hospital, and then pursued her pediatric training at Buffalo in 2000. She is one of the most energetic people I know. She's inspiring. She's full of energy and passion, and she is an advocate for people with IDD. She's a well-loved teacher, excellent dentist, and an advocate for those with IDD, a perfect role model for future dentists alike. I'm proud to have her on our panel tonight and introduce her and the panel. And I welcome you all to our uh, virtual grand round. On to you, Dr. Tona. Thank you so much. So um, I, I just wanna thank you so much, Dr. Wong. And really, you um, really were the inspiration for this to become a live presentation. Uh, we had recorded this as a pilot study last spring. And then after Dr. Wong's experience in rehabilitation, I think he, he really kind of realized this connection even more and really was the impetus for us to, to you know, he, he recontacted us and was the impetus for us to continue working on this and, and forging this path forward. So I really, really want to, to thank you for that. Um, today, we're going to be joined by dental residents, Dr. Crystal Baldwin and Dr. Aya Kalelot, and five occupational therapy graduate students, Erica Eads, Allison Laquadera, Paige Sarnataro, Ashley Tushong, and Bridget Whalen. And if you see me reaching over here, it's because I'm also 
joined by my, by my dog, Cloud, who sits next to me under a blanket. So you might, you might see that from time to time. Uh, we're also joined, um, as, uh, as Dr. Wong said, by Dr. Dion, a marvelous pediatric dentist in Buffalo. And I am Jan Tona, the Occupational Therapy Program Director at the University of Buffalo. We wanna take a minute to thank Dr. Steve Perlman, who couldn't be with us tonight, um, because he, he really brought us all together initially and has, you know, is just a legend in pediatric dentistry and has been a, a very important part of our connection and our, and our collaboration. And Dr. Clive Friedman, uh, who has really spent his life um, working with people with disabilities through his dentistry work and really generously has shared his ideas and, um, you know, many of his techniques with us. And we really, really appreciate that. And Dr. Laura Anderson is a clinical psychologist in the Buffalo area who has been working with us. And we really appreciate all of her work and we're hoping that she'll continue to be a part of our team. This presentation, um, uh, please don't reproduce this material. If you wanna reproduce anything, just, you know, if you could uh, send me an email and let me know, that would be great. I just wanna take a, a, a pause for a minute. So um, some of you may have received, uh, may have uh, seen a survey on your invitation to join this webinar. The occupational therapy students are collecting um, information from uh, dentists, hygienists, dental medicine students, and also dental hygiene students. I don't know why that wasn't on there. And uh, some of you completed that before you started. They're kind of doing a pre-test, post-test. They're collecting a little data. They're using that for their capstone project. So if you did complete that survey, we thank you and we'll be sending you a survey after this to complete. If you did not complete the survey, that's fine. But if you want to share this um, webinar with any friends, you might think that, you know, you might find the, the webinar beneficial. Um, recordings from last week uh, can be found at the AADMD, this AADMD the um, website. And then we also have handouts for today. And I just want to go into the handouts for today. Um, let me just get there. Courtney, I'm wondering if in the chat room, if you could put the AADMD website in there, that might be helpful uh, so people can get it out of the chat box so they can share that, the recordings with other people. In this link, this tiny URL link, um, you'll find uh, handouts. Um, Oh, today's handouts aren't in there. We didn't put today's handouts in. Handouts from last week are in there. Uh, we, will put a, we will upload today's handouts. There's a reference list, uh, a list of products. There's a pre-visit survey that Dr. Clyde Friedman uh, prepared or allowed us to share. And we'll be talking about that today and some history of um, things that dental medicine and uh, occupational therapy have collaborated on at the University at Buffalo. So I am going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Dion. Awesome, thank you very much and hello to everyone. I see you're joining from all over the US, Texas and California. Greetings from Buffalo, New York and thank you to Dr. Wong for your introduction. We have really great memories of your visit with Dr. Perlman to Buffalo. I hope this picture reminds you of that. And I hope on your return post COVID-19 that we will have an established OTDDS program based on all the information presented here. So the topic tonight begins with behavior support. And I have to say that as a pediatric dentist, as pediatric dentists, we believe strongly in non-pharmacological behavior support techniques to alleviate anxiety and to perform quality oral health care, of course, safely but we do appreciate any additional advice and an insight to understanding the behavior we see. Along with our pediatric dental residents, we as attendings are obligated to teach dental students to manage patients with IDDD. We know that there can be challenges in behavior and selection of the technique chosen for behavior guidance must be tailored to the needs and ability of our patients. So Dr. Tiani, you bring up a really good point there. And I, I just wanna say that 
I have always been really amazed at pediatric dentists. I think that you all have just a really remarkable way of working with patients. I know my own children um, were patients at uh, University of Pediatric Dentistry when they were children. They had such positive experiences and they have never had negative feelings about going to the dentist. Um, when I ask them about their memories, they talk about the warm relationships that they made with the hygienist. They remember the hygienist's name. Um, they talk about the dentist. They talk about playing video games. And Dr. Creighton had little toys that they could throw up and they would stick to the ceiling. And the next time they came in, they would look for their toy. And they remember all those wonderful things. So I know pediatric dentists have wonderful uh, techniques for working with children and are really, really skilled. I think when we're talking about the IDDD population, um, I think that pediatric dentists have a lot of ideas and pediatric hygienists have a lot of ideas about ways to work with this population. But I, the impression I'm getting is that there hasn't been a lot of communication. And so I think that there are pockets that have really good ideas. And one of the things that we've been doing in our work is gathering that information. Our students have been observing really skilled pediatric hygienists. And we've um, queried over 100 um, parents and caregivers about what, was, um, what were, were barriers and facilitators in the dental office. And so that's some of the things that we're sharing today, along with some of the techniques um, and, and thoughts that we have as occupational therapists. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I would really treasure your expertise with one of my most challenging patients. Um, this is a five-year-old with dramatic behavior and, however, a very sweet girl, but she is undiagnosed according to her mom. The patient's grandmother looks over to me as if to say, what you see is what you get. The mother completes the medical history as unremarkable again. The child runs and screams and throws herself on the floor, but mom wants her to sit in that chair to have a full cleaning done. And so for a few months, we tried weekly patterning, seeing her at quiet office times, but we we're really battling through those tough lap exams, Dr. Tona, providing resources for a diagnosis, providing support, and then all of a sudden COVID-19 set upon us. And we know it would be absolutely unsafe to bring her in during the pandemic. With her behavior, she might run through the office, breaching our standard of protocol, hurting herself, putting her family at risk, putting her at risk, putting everyone at risk. I guess we could try teledental appointments, but again, she has never been able to sit still even for a lap exam. Those have been very difficult. So in her chart, we classify her as Frankel behavior zero, and I can explain that here. The Frankel behavior scale is a behavior system used in dentistry and in research. And it separates behavior into four categories, ranging from definitely negative, which will be a zero, to definitely positive, which will be a four. Now I'm taking into consideration that this little patient of mine is more than likely on the autism spectrum disorder. And it just seems unfair to classify her using Frankel behavior scale. So I'm looking for advice, and this to me would be a case worth linking with OT, with child psychology. Am I right? Oh, you're absolutely yes. right. It sounds like a really great case for a team approach. I think child psychology would have an awful lot to offer. I know myself as an occupational therapist, I would, I would welcome you know, the opportunity to work with this child. Um, it sounds challenging. But you know, I, I have some ideas of what I would want to see. As an OT, I would probably interview the family to get some idea of the child's sensory processing, probably do a standardized sensory processing test to take a look and see if there are patterns to the way she's reacting to different sensory stimulation to see if that might be underlying some of her behaviors. And I'd probably also want to look at her, her muscle strength and muscle tone and her movement patterns and look for any reflexes. And I would really wanna look at her oral motor skills and get a sense of what's happening with her mouth and how she's able to move her mouth, the types of food that she eats, all of that would give me some ideas. And then of course, looking at her activities of daily living as far as brushing and flossing, getting some sense of whether or not she's getting stimulation into her mouth every day. And I think with all of that, you would, we'd be able to put something together that would help to make that dental visit a little more successful. So um, 
This brings us to actually our first module, the, the first part of today's module. This is module four, one through three are in the previous recording. And um, we're gonna look at uh, behavioral supports for individuals with IDDD in the dental office. Paige, would you like to start? Sure. So when we talk about behavior, we're talking about the way in which someone conducts themselves, which is often a response to stimulation or to the environment. The behaviors that we see in the dental office are ways our patients are conducting themselves in response to stimulation and in response to the dental environment, which is full of people, noises, unusual touch, smells, and unfamiliar procedures. The expectations of how to act are very unclear, and especially the first few times a patient attends a dental visit. The behaviors we see in the dental office are also influenced by past experiences. If you recall the work of Pavlov's classical conditioning, our patients experience physiologic reactions to the dental office based on their past experience. The behaviors that we see are also forms of communication about the patient's reaction to the physical and non-physical environment. And interpreting that communication can be tricky. Let's take a few minutes to reframe the idea of behavior from being the way that someone acts to a means of communication. If we view behavior as a form of communication, we can understand that individuals who are able to express themselves verbally have less need for extreme nonverbal behavioral communication. The spoken word reduces the need for, need for extreme behavior. For some of our patients, the spoken word takes the form of sign language, assistive communication devices, a simple communication picture board, or even specific gestures that the caregivers have come to understand as having specific meanings, such as yes or no. Unfortunately, many of the individuals that we work with, ID, DD, have limited verbal skills. Nonverbal communication can be clear, but often requires interpretation from someone who knows the individual well. Establishing a means of verbal and nonverbal communication in the early in the healthcare relationship increases the likelihood of successful future visits. You know, Paige, listening to this and thinking about the case that I described, I'm realizing that the patient I described is nonverbal. So maybe she's trying to tell us something with her behavior. Bridget, can you tell us a little bit more about supporting behavior? Yes. When faced with a difficult behavior in the dental office, it is important to remember these three keys. The first key is that to identify the cause of the behavior. You don't want to try implementing a behavioral strategy before knowing the reason for that behavior, which we will discuss further in later slides. The second key is to assess the patient's developmental level, comprehension, and communication skills. You must determine if the patient's parents or guardians will need to be present in order to express the patient's needs. It is also important to ensure that the patient's communication device is present if applicable. The last key is to use the least restrictive behavior technique appropriate for that patient. The goal is to increase compliance and reduce the amount of behavioral supports, restraints, or sedation needed for the patient while receiving oral care. When trying to determine the cause of a patient's behavior, a helpful strategy is to remember the mnemonic MEETS. The M stands refers to medical causes, which may include injury, illness, psychiatric conditions, and such. This should always be ruled out first, as it usually has a sudden onset, appearing to happen for no reason. It may even be associated with a current body position. The E stands for escape, as the patient may be demonstrating this behavior to avoid a task or de demand. Remember, the patient may want to escape the dental office due to previous traumatic experiences in the dental office or even due to previous physical or sexual abuse. A for attention. This refers to the possibility of the patient seeking attention, whether verbal, social, or physical. We probably don't think of the patient as seeking attention because they are generally the center of attention during the exam. However, you may notice more demanding behaviors emerge if you are carrying on a conversation with a parent or another professional. T is for tangible. This refers to patients that may be seeking access to an item, service, or activity. This could work for, to our advantage. For example, if you provide a toy or a sticker for a child who has a good behavior. And lastly, S for sensory, as discussed in the previous module, refers to a patient's behavioral responses to various sensory experiences in the dental office, such as the looks, smells, feels, and tastes. 
The best way to promote a positive experience in the dental office is to set the stage for success. This includes a pre-visit survey, scheduling to avoid halt situations, preparing the individual to know what will be happening before arriving, and communicating throughout the session so the patient knows what to expect. Now, let's look at each of these individually. A pre-visit survey can help dental health professionals to be prepared for the new patients before they arrive and to try to make the initial visit as positive as possible. Patients who have a positive first experience will associate the dental office with positive feelings and memories and be more likely to feel relaxed upon return. Dr. Clyde Friedman has graciously shared a pre-visit survey that he uses, and we have located that in your resource found here. So this is the survey that Dr. Friedman uses. The survey um, has, they, they state the purpose at the top, which is really nice so that the families know why you're asking them to fill this out. It goes through the diagnosis and medications. A little history about oral care, understanding um, you know, how the child completes oral care at home and what the goals are for the family. This is really important. You may have goals that the, that the, the individual will you know, sit and allow you to brush their teeth in the dental chair and the family may be wanting a full scaling or vice versa. So it's important to be on the same page and understand each other's goals. It asks about the diet, which is certainly important from the aspect of you know, having a healthy diet, also helps you a little bit to know if there are preferences and dislikes. If they have a really limited diet, that may be a sign of some sensory defensiveness in their mouth. Looking at support systems in school, are they getting any special help in school? I would probably add to this OTPT and speech because I think that that can tell you what other services they have and you may be able to collaborate with those professionals with the parent permission. They might have ideas of ways to make the dental visit a little easier. Um, socialization and reinforcement. One of the questions is what does your child do to self-regulate? Dr. Friedman says that there is um, a video that goes with this to help to explain that. But I think most parents who have children who have difficulty with self-regulation understand what this means. And what we're talking about there is anything that the child does to help to maintain a calm, alert state as much as possible. So they may provide some sensory stimulation for themselves. They may do some type of rocking or some type of other stimulation. Um, it may be a routine that they follow that helps them to stay calm and alert. And, and um, you know whatever that is, the family has the opportunity to share that with you. Um, the survey goes on and asks about behavioral rewards. It asks about um, sensitivity so that you have an understanding if they are overly sensitive before they even come in. Really importantly, it asks about how the child communicates and um, how communicates about their sensitivities, but then also asks about communication in general, which is extremely important to know how you're going to communicate with that individual child or adult um, with IDDD before they come in. So you can have some idea of how you're going to be able to interact with them. And then probably the most important is other because there are, I'm sure are things that we can't even think of that are very important for caregivers to share with us. So I think this is a really nice um, tool and uh, that is available to you as well. Okay, so Erica, now can you tell us a little bit more about um, possible causes of behavior? Yes. It's important to remember that individuals with IDDD may be uncooperative or of difficult behavior for the same reasons that individuals without IDDD are uncooperative or of difficult behavior. The acronym HALT is often used in addiction recovery to remind people to halt when they're having a difficult time and take a moment to determine if they are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, as these conditions make it much more difficult to control our thoughts and behaviors. The same can be applied to our patients. We use the HALT principle proactively by reminding caregivers to make sure the patient is fed before coming to the office, starting our session with pleasant discussion to reduce anger, allowing a family member or caregiver to be present in the room to reduce fears of being alone, and taking nap time into account when scheduling appointments to avoid the patient being tired. In addition to preparing the dental office and the staff for our patients, we can also prepare the patients for the dental office. Let's hear from Sujit, 
a motivational speaker and a man with Down syndrome whose parents are both dentists. We asked Suji to tell us what he thought would be the most important thing to consider when working with well, individuals with IDDD to increase comfort in the dental office. It was me because um, I'm, I'm always okay for going to dentists, but uh, at least I have my parents because they're my dental work. So um, I'm comfortable with my parents, but not only like to say that by going to a dentist, to the office, like at home, especially with my parents, but like it's how to, uh, what they want, um, how they want to get their teeth done, getting x-rays and uh, cleaning or uh, like explaining different things what they need to use the tools, but, but before explaining, before you go to the dentist. Oh, so you think it's really helpful if the family tells you before mm -hmm. you go to the dentist, if they say this yeah, is what's going to happen today, you're going to yeah. go to the dentist today and you're going to get an x-ray. Yeah. I think that would be, that's helpful to know ahead of time what's going to happen yes. today. So one of the things that some dentists do is they have videotape, you know, mm -hmm. they watch online before you go. So yeah. you could watch like, what happens at a cleaning like and it might show that the person going to the dentist's office you're going to go and yeah. you're going to sit in this chair and it's an actual picture of somebody sitting in the chair like i took your picture the other day yeah and then somebody you're going to open your mouth and they're going to count your teeth and they're going to put this you know special tool in your mouth and they're going to yeah. you know put this instrument in your mouth and clean your teeth and then showing people what it means to get an x-ray do you think it would be yeah. helpful if the if all of the dentist's office had that online for people to watch beforehand? Well, that would be great. <laughs> so Suji um, also asked me to share with you his website, um, and it's uh, sujit.com. You can see Sujit's also a musician. And in addition to that, um, I wanted to point out he has a lot of different information down here. And he, he does have um, some of his mother's dental publications here. His mother, as I said, um, is a dentist. She works with uh, individuals with special needs. That's been her background. And she really started after um, having Sujit. And so she's sort of a pioneer, is, is really has been doing this for a long time. So I just thought some of you may find that interesting and educational. Sujit's idea of telling patients about their upcoming dental visit is very much in line with the strategy of using social stories to prepare patients for the dental visit. A social story is a tool used by occupational therapists and other professionals to teach individuals routines, expectations, and behavioral standards. The use of visual examples accompany the action to allow for further comprehension. Let's look at some examples. So here is a very simple social story. This could be developed with relative ease and could have pictures from your actual dental office. The social story could be uploaded online and copies could also be kept in the waiting room for patients to take home for their next visit. The next one we'll look at is a much more complex social story. And this one is unique because, can, because families can send in a photo of their child to have their child's face personalized in the video. So let's take a look at this video to get some idea of how the dental office is introduced. This is a movie about you going to the dentist. At the dentist office, you will wait in the waiting room before your appointment. time to clean and count your teeth. When your name is called, you will walk into another room. A grown-up will stay with you the whole time. Okay, time to sit in a chair. You will go into a room with a special chair. Great job sitting down in the special chair. Now the hygienist will help to get you ready for the dentist. There will be a bright light to help see inside your mouth. 
Now it is time for you to get a special dentist bib. That was easy. The hygienist will use a mirror to look at your teeth and also count them. Open wide. Great job. This will take just a minute. Now you are ready to have your teeth cleaned. The hygienist will use a special brush that sounds like this. This is fun and the hygienist is very gentle. You're doing an awesome job. Now you are ready to see the dentist. The hygienist will go and get the dentist. Good job waiting while the grown-ups talk to each other. Now the dentist will use the mirror to look in your mouth. Open wide, very good. After the dentist looks at your teeth and counts them, you are finished. The bright light can be moved and your bib can come off. Going to the dentist is all done. Look at you now. You went to the dentist. Okay. Awesome. So you can make a similar video at your own office without providing the opportunity for families to ind individualize the face. Your own video can help patients to become familiar with the rules and routines of your office before coming to their appointment. Social stories are especially useful for individuals with autism who greatly benefit from visual supports. Here is a link to Pathfinders for Autism where you can find some free examples of social stories for dental visits. So this has a variety of um, different social stories that you can look at and we'll put that link in the resource file. Awesome. And finally, Here's a link from the University Pediatric Dentistry, which is not a complete social story, but is a video that families can self-narrate to prepare individuals for a trip to the dental office during COVID.
So I think that's so important because um, it really, uh, that whole piece of routine is so important for so many of, of um, our patients, of your patients. You know, you think that um, sometimes it takes years to get a child used to that routine of the dental office, especially individuals with IDDD. And now that whole routine has been uprooted. So really anything you can do ahead of time to get them ready, I think is, is um, really important. Ashley? While social stories help before the individual arrives to your clinic, once the individual is in the clinic, they will really benefit from the dental health professionals communicating throughout. This begins with establishing a communication strategy. If you used a pre-visit survey, you have some ideas, ideas of how verbal the patient is and if the patient routinely uses an assistive communication device. If the patient does use a device, be sure to use it in converse in the beginning and also keep it close by so the patient can communicate in needed during the, during the session. Caregivers can help to establish the best means of communication. Once you understand if the patient has standard verbal or nonverbal responses, be sure to seek permission before touching the patient. This can be as simple as a statement about what you will be doing with a pause to ascertain if the patient agrees. For example, the dental health professional might say, I'm going to open your mouth and hold this small mirror inside so I can see the back of your teeth to make sure that they are healthy. Is that okay? If the patient is not able to provide verbal consent, ask the caregiver to help interpret the response. As we discussed last week, we cannot know our patient's history and the trauma they have endured. Unfortunately, many individuals with IDDD have sustained trauma related to medical procedures, physical and sexual abuse, and overstimulation from inappropriate environments. This makes communication and asking permission even more important. Let's hear from Dr. Desai about her experience as a pioneer dentist who began working with individuals with disabilities in the 1970s. That was my first thing, you know, that um, we had this, if they need a OT patient, whoever speech therapist would come with them, of course, parents, and just get a little background. For Sujit, it was easy. Sometimes for Down syndrome, it is easy because they don't have physical disability and uh, they're pretty verbal, right? Uh, um, but the problem comes with the um, autism or, you know, physically disabled. And for that, you do need that staff or um, parent, uh, whoever, you know, they are comfortable with. As Dr. Desai discusses, the tell, show, do method involves three steps. The first step, tell, involves a verbal explanation of all steps of the procedure. This allows the individual to become familiarized with the dental setting and desensitizes them to the process with well-described expectations. The next step, show, involves demonstrating all sensory aspects of the procedure in a non-threatening way, such as the visual, auditory, olfactory, and tactile aspects of the procedure. The last step, do, involves completing the procedure exactly as you described. It is crucial that you do not deviate from the explanation or demonstration when you perform the procedure. Dr. Desai suggests that having the first visit to the dentist be focused on tell, show, do to allow the patient to become familiar with the setting without undue stress to complete procedures. Let's take a look at Dr. Dion using the tell, show, do method with the patient. We like to put a bib on you. Let's see if that works. Let me put your bib on just like this. Awesome. If you like, you can put your hand right over there to hold it for me. I always like that. Right here to hold that for me. There you go. Perfect. Awesome. You think it's important to put some glasses on you? you want some glasses for the light or you're okay? What you think? This is our mirror. I know this slides away a lot. We use this so that we can count your teeth like we count your fingers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
lips. And we'll do the same thing for your mouth. So it'll be nice and long. Let's see if I can just slide my mirror on the side first. So I would usually do that. I don't know if that's helpful. I go to the mm -hmm. side instead mm -hmm. of going straight in. Mm -hmm. You know, I just feel like it gives me a chance to um, slowly make my way where mm -hmm. I want to go. Good. Let's try. So if anybody watched this child last week, he does not have his, um, he does not have the weighted blanket on this time. He's very calm. And, and a lot of that is because Dr. Dion is speaking to him with a very calm voice. So I want to really stress that calm voice is really important. And then the tell show do that she's doing, he's really ready for whatever happens. And if he knows what's going to happen in his mouth, he's able to stay very calm. Other side and see how you do. Awesome. Good job. Good job. She told him when she was going to the other side, so he knew that the other side of his mouth was going to be stimulated. Now I'm going to get my explorer so I can show you for counting. I like to tell my students to count with this side first. One, two, three, four, five. Before going in with the pointy side that kids are really worried about. And for me, we go from behind. So that does cause, like I always realize when I do that, they get a little mm -hmm. Like where it's right, because I suddenly disappear. Well, you suddenly disappear and something's coming at them. So we had a conversation there. Um, I think that part of that is, is because she suddenly disappears, but I think even more than that is when, um, when Dr. Dion suddenly comes around from the back, he wasn't expecting stimulation from that side. So just that, little change, um, you know, can make a, a difference. Um, so, okay. My, com my computer is, is acting up on me now, so I'm just going to go on to the next slide. All so, right, so perhaps this is a good spot for the residents to chat with us thank about. Thank you, Dr. Tona. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Dr. Aya. I'm a first year pediatric dental resident using Telshodu on a daily basis with all patients, especially those with IDDD. Telshodu is a standard of care for behavior guidance as presented by the, AA, by the AAPD and the ADA. One case in particular where I found Telshodu especially beneficial was from about one week ago. A 19-year-old male presented with autism, um, and he was being seen for a cleaning by one of our amazing hygienists, Maria. During the exam, I noticed early signs of enamel breakdown on the buccal pit of the lower right first permanent molar number 30. Keeping the treatment triangle in mind, I discussed with mom that I would prefer to seal this area of the tooth as a preventative measure to decrease its risk of becoming carious. His mom was very appreciative and agreed, so Maria and I worked together with the patient and mom to have their treatment done before he left that day. Telshodu played a big role in completing that sealant on the same day. If we didn't tell the patient what to expect or communicated to him what we were doing, his Frankel score would have probably been a lot different. I am truly excited about this collaboration with OT because in situations like this, there are instances when tell show do doesn't go well and will fail. Next, my co-resident, Dr. Crystal, will elaborate on her experiences with tell show do in an educational and training perspective. Hello, my name is Dr. Crystal. I am also a first year pediatric dental resident. I recently graduated from UB's dental school where tell show do was implemented in our didactic course, simulation lab, and clinical experience. Our competency was then assessed with an OSCE. The OSCE interactions typically exposed us to more complex patients. This allowed faculty to give us feedback and suggestions for improvement. It has been noted in the end of semester class evaluations that students are more comfortable handling challenging environments and will be more likely to see patients with IDDD. Many students have stated that they feel more prepared and can, can communicate more effectively with IDD population. This will positively impact direct patient care with the patient population, allowing us to demonstrate empathy and enthusiasm during our comprehensive care. I personally would like to thank Dr. Tammy Thompson, our lead attending in the OSCE assessments. OSCE, which stands for Objective Structed structured clinical examination gives each dental student a chance to practice communication in difficult patient exams. Ali, can you share more about the use of communication during examination of a patient with disabilities? 
Of course. It is important to communicate your movements and procedures throughout the exam, letting the patient know when you'll be changing location or stimulation in the mouth. You can use a talk aloud method to say things like, now I'm going to clean the teeth on the other side of your mouth, or now I'm going to spray some water in your mouth. You may even want to consider having the patient hold a mirror or the caregiver hold the mirror as shown in this photo so they can anticipate where their mouth will be touched. Clearly, this may not be a good idea for procedures that may be upsetting to watch, but could be very helpful for cleaning the teeth of apprehensive patients. When considering behavior support strategies, we must think about parent and caregiver presence or absence. The presence of the patient's parent or guardian may facilitate a patient's cooperation, but it can also exacerbate their behavior, especially if the parent is apprehensive themselves. Dr. Clyde Friedman recommends asking the parent or caregiver to hold the child at the lower legs and provide firm pressure during the exam. This strategy serves several purposes, as it provides a physical connection between the patient and a loved one, it provides firm pressure, which is generally calming, and it gives the caregiver an important job to do, which helps to build the team and reinforce the important role of the caregiver. Patients' response to parents' presence or absence will vary, and the parameters of the parents' involvement should be discussed ahead of time. It is crucial that you discuss first with the parent who may be the patient's most effective communicator, as the patient may not be able to communicate discomfort and mixed messages may be transmitted. The next strategy we will discuss is positive reinforcement. This technique is used to reward desired behaviors and increase the likelihood of such behaviors recurring. Such reinforcement can be social or tangible. Social reinforcers can be the use of positive voice modulation, facial expressions, verbal praise, and appropriate physical demonstrations of approval, such as a high five. Tangible reinforcers can be small items like stickers or toys. Reinforcement should be immediately after the desired behavior and frequent in order for the patient to associate desired behaviors with the reward. For example, the patient gets to listen to 30 seconds of their favorite song immediately after they open their mouth for one minute. I absolutely love this topic, and I'm sure everyone who knows me knows I love to reward the patients. But, you know, there are times when I struggle with when to provide the reinforcer or the toy at the end or the sticker, because I want to give a prize to everyone, regardless how they behaved. And I had a case just on Monday where a patient is walking out after an appointment, and I had heard him crying through the appointment. So... Of course, I decided to give him a handful of toys at the end, and it just did not feel right. Um, so, John, can you offer some advice? Because I think he thinks that the gift was reinforcing his negative behavior since I gave him a gift at the end of a negative appointment. Yeah, that that is a concern, and that's I think that's always a challenge for us because when children, you know, or anyone, when individuals don't display the behavior that we that we are hoping for and they're not as cooperative as we are hoping that they would be. And we've done all of the things that, that we can do to you know, check their sensory system and do all of that. Um, we want them to leave feeling positive because that's really important from a you know, conditioning perspective. We want them to have a positive memory for when they come back. So I can understand the desire to give them you know, stickers or rewards when they leave. But at the same time, you are rewarding that, that behavior that you really didn't want to see. So I think the, the thing to think about is to break down the behavior that you want to see into small increments and reward very small increments. So if the child knows or the, if, if the adult knows, if the individual knows, you need to, you know, we really want you to um, uh, uh, be, be quiet and keep your mouth open until the timer goes off. And maybe the timer's 15 seconds initially and they get a sticker. And maybe when they get enough stickers, they get a prize at the end, or maybe they get a high five or they get some kind of a reward for that very small increment. And then those increments can slowly, you know, get, get bigger. And I think one thing to remember too, is to tell 
the patient what you want them to do and don't tell them what you don't want them to do. Mm. So if they don't close your mouth, they're going to close their mouth. So you have to say, keep your mouth open. So those are a couple of things that might be helpful. Thank you. Paige, can you give us some more techniques? Sure. So the next behavior support strategy is the use of distraction. And this can be used to divert the patient's attention from what may be perceived as an unpleasant procedure. The aim is to decrease the perception of unpleasantness and avert negative or avoidance behavior. This can be as simple as just talking to the individual during the procedure. Other examples can include asking the parent to play with the patient, using headphones to play music, allowing the patient to watch a video or giving a patient a short break during stressful procedures. The last two strategies we will discuss in this module are desensitization and modeling. Desensitization is a technique that involves gradual exposure to the feared object or situation with practice. You may want to start with just having the patient walk into the building and then progress to sitting in the chair to then having a toothbrush in their mouth and progress finally to getting through a full cleaning. Modeling is a technique that involves active imitation in which the patient watches a sibling participate in similar procedures before them or watches a demonstration of the procedure on a model or other prop. This allows the patient to visually anticipate what to expect, which may be helpful for an avoided patient who is fearful of the dentist's office or unfamiliar settings. Obviously, this may be limited with COVID precautions. A successful dental visit with an individual with IDDD is dependent on many factors. Certainly, preparation is key. And this includes setting the stage for a successful visit by involving the entire oral health team, starting with the receptionist. And you can also arrange for a desensitizing appointment to help the patient become familiar with the dental office, staff, and equipment before oral health procedures begin. And you can allow patients to bring in comfort items. Another tip is to make appointments short whenever possible, ensuring only to provide services that the child can tolerate. Lastly, remember to praise and reinforce good behavior. Try to end each session on a positive note so that they will not associate going to the dentist, dentist with negative experiences. You want the child to associate the dental visit with positive thought, thoughts, so they will be more compliant and less fearful in the future. Now, Let's review a case study to apply what we've learned. Marcus is a seven-year-old boy with Down syndrome. Every time he comes to the dental office, he screams and cries and runs out of the office. His mom says she is able to brush his teeth at home and he, has, he does not have excessive sensitivity. The dental health team is developing a plan to increase Marcus's compliance in the dental office. Which of the following would be least appropriate for this plan? A, ask his mother to leave the room. B, prevent a sticker chart before the procedure and give him a sticker immediately after it's done. C, allow him to watch his favorite show during the procedure. And D, end the session with something positive that Marcus will enjoy and remember for, for the next time he comes in. All right, so we're gonna launch a poll so you can all take the poll. So which of the following would be the least appropriate for Marcus? Okay, I'm gonna end the poll here. And I will share the results. The most people chose A, ask his mother to leave the room. And Bridget? A is the least appropriate for his plan because his mother may be his link to security. B is appropriate because it will help him to know when his behavior is desired. C is also appropriate because it will distract and entertain him during the exam. D is classical conditioning and will increase participation. Let's take a look more closely at the challenges that COVID-19 have presented. Dr. Dion? Thank you. 
So before we take a look at the impact of COVID-19, the patient case you just completed with us, Marcus, really reminds me of the case that I spoke about at the start of tonight's webinar. Some of what I have learned from the lecture is that a pre-screening form completed by the parent and a pre-visit social story could lead to a more positive appointment. Preparation is key. Interviewing the parents ahead of time is a great idea. And I can certainly reach out to the mom and encourage her to have us try again. But the new challenge, however, would be the restrictions of COVID-19. Our population with IDDD are vulnerable to the challenges presented by these restrictions and to the virus itself. So this brings us to COVID considerations and modifications for treating patients with IDDD. The takeaway points are here on this overview slide. Although patients' visits are compromised, we have to remind the community that dentistry is an essential service and that our patients with IDDD are more susceptible to contracting the virus. As dentists, we have the duty to reduce contributing factors and to keep our patients healthy. And this may mean altering the treatment plan, but for our patients that we've worked so hard on patterning and developing routines for comfortable appointments, COVID-19 brings changes in their established routines. And we should be ready with stronger communication to deliver support. So on this slide, we're looking at our department and the practice plan at University Pediatric Dentistry. The practice plan has been treating patients with disabilities for more than 20 years. When you can put data behind our initiatives, which in this case includes equitable access to care, then there is added strength. The graph in this slide shows patient care for hygiene only, not operative, not emergencies, and it does not reflect all of our patients with IDDD. But on the vertical axis is the number of patients who showed for hygiene appointments. The orange line indicates 2019, the gray line 2020. In 2019, we were on an upward trajectory, as you can see, when compared to 2020. And you can certainly appreciate the sudden drop due to COVID-19 and then the buildup. So it took us almost about four months to return to our somewhat normal. And as you can imagine, those months began with preparation for reopening and following standards of protocol to support our community's oral health visits. The American Dental Association's policy states that oral health is an integral component of systemic health and explains dentistry is essential health care because of its role in evaluating, diagnosing, preventing, or treating oral diseases, which can affect systemic health. The dental health professionals in the audience, I'm sure you would probably all agree that this has been a challenge, considering the international, national, state, organizational recommendations and guidelines which happened to be changing daily. Every office had to make a decision, right? And at University Pediatric Dentistry and the dental school, we decided to implement each guideline in order to our students, our residents, and our workforce. So let's take a look at a few cases and use that to discuss the challenges and the modifications during COVID-19. So here is patient M, who is a 25-year-old with cerebral palsy. When stay-at-home orders were given in Western New York, our team began to make care calls. A care call to this family resulted in a request for a teledental appointment as the parents had strong concerns. The teledental appointment included a visual of patient M with his teeth completely covered in calculus. The patient had a scheduled appointment in the operating room, but that was now canceled due to COVID-19. So a decision was made to bring the patient in and try for hand scaling in the chair. 
as his behavior at home was changing for the worse and he was not eating and he seemed despondent. Appointment made, the patient arrived with the parent, temperatures are taken, screening questions are asked, all the necessary PPE, N95 masks placed under level three masks, gloves, gowns, and shields were worn by the staff. We pretty much look like astronauts. We cannot take any chances. We still had the patient pre-rinse with peroxide, even though it's not a mandate. And we used an ISOVAC high functioning device. We played music through the appointment and he absolutely did well. We completed his care at a second appointment, and most importantly, the parents remarked that he was eating and doing well at home. So home care was emphasized, and we will see him monthly to assist in his care. So the take-home points, firstly, stay in contact and utilize care calls and teledentistry. You know, we are asking patients to stay in contact with their dentists but really we need to stay in contact with our patients. Secondly, expect to modify your treatment to reduce aerosols and elective surgeries. And thirdly, remember the oral cavity and its relation to respiratory health and the risk of our patients with IDDD. As you would recall from part one of our webinar, People with IDDD have a higher prevalence of comorbid risk factors, hypertension, respiratory diseases, diabetes, risk factors associated with poorer COVID-19 outcomes. And they also have a greater prevalence of periodontal disease. Studies have shown that there lies a strong link between periodontal health and pulmonary disease. The aspiration of the bacteria from the oropharynx can cause respiratory infection. Naturally, good oral hygiene and good periodontal health play an important role in the health of your patients, especially during this coronavirus spread. Testing for COVID-19 can be a challenge. And for some, being hospitalized for COVID-19 presents challenges such as starting an IV, placing a breathing tube, taking x-rays or blood tests, and perhaps all of this is happening without their family or without somebody who they trust at their side. In some states, we know that COVID-19 fatality rates are three times greater amongst people with IDDD who have tested positive in comparison to rates amongst the general population. So here is patient J on a lighter note. And the take home message here is to remember the issues of social distancing and the changes in routine that our patients with IDDD now face. Patient J has always been the smiliest of kids and loved how everyone would comment on his smile the minute he entered the waiting room at the dental office. Well, with COVID-19, now there is no waiting room. He checks in from the car with his family a mask covers his smile and his winning personality. He has to have his temperature taken and only one family member can accompany him. He's wheeled back into the clinic where we are donned in heavy PPE with muffled voices behind our shields and our masks. We complete the cleaning and then he describes as he's putting his mask back on that his mask is a very special mask with the words stay back printed on it. And he said, this is because people are having a problem social distancing from him. He explains that this is because he's so cute and they want to get within six feet of him, but they're not allowed to. Mom's mask says six feet back, please. She says, I've worked so hard making him social and now I have to ask him to respect social distancing. So patients may not expect these new COVID-19 routines and regulations, and they may not be able to communicate questions or symptoms verbally. It is very important to anticipate your patient's needs, settle them into these new routines, and implement new social stories 
with clear communication throughout. So those two cases that I presented are of young men with disabilities who live with their parents. Dr. Crystal will share a case of a patient who lived in a congregate care facility or group home and whose dental home has closed. Dr. Aya would then present a case of a patient without a dental home who depends on a school dental program, also now closed. Let's hear from our pediatric dental residents, keeping in mind the take home COVID-19 restriction messages. Dr. Crystal? So before COVID-19, my patient was seen at the Conventus Clinic, which is now closed. She presents with her direct support personnel who describes her as a 25 year old with a developmental challenge whose routine has changed due to COVID restrictions. She has since increased her habit of nail biting and presents with a broken front tooth from this habit. Upon entry into the room, I had to explain what we were gonna do and all the materials that were surrounding her before she was even willing to sit in the chair. Although initially she was apprehensive, I was able to successfully obtain a radiograph and complete the procedure. In order to do so, I provided continuous communication throughout the appointment and used behavioral guidance techniques such as tell, show, do. Before I started the treatment, I gave her a mirror and I showed her how her tooth looked at the start of the appointment. I then gave her the mirror at the end of the appointment and she was able to see the final results. She was thrilled with the results and I was happy I could provide the care. It would have been nice to treat all of her teeth at that visit. However, she will return for a cleaning and for complete comprehensive care. Her Frankel score for the visit was a three because initially she was apprehensive, but she did cooperate. A concern that I had throughout the appointment was that the patient has seizures and they are stress induced. So I worked really hard with the patient to try and maintain a low stress level throughout the appointment. Now I'll hand it over to Dr. Aya. Thank you, Dr. Crystal. Lastly, I would like to share a case that demonstrates treatment challenges during COVID-19 in a hospital setting. A 16 year old male with nonverbal autism was admitted to the PICU in October due to severe agitation, which could be possibly related by, to dental pain. A few weeks prior, he was given antibiotics due to the swelling on the right side of his face. As you can see in the photos, number three and numbers three and 19 are fractured, and upon examination, he had caries on numbers two, 30, 31, and early non-cavitated lesions on his maxillary anterior teeth. In order to provide immediate treatment, we decided to schedule the patient for the OR the next day. The patient had already received a COVID test five days prior, but due to hospital protocol, he needed another COVID test before the OR procedure the next day. Unfortunately, the pandemic has resulted in many patients losing contact with health serv services and community programs. This patient did not have a dental home and he was being seen through Summit Outreach Program in Buffalo for oral health screenings prior to COVID. Sadly, this outreach program has been put on hold due to COVID, which has left many vulnerable patients like this patient without communication or contact with dental health professionals. My hope is to connect this patient to a dental home to establish regular dental care and hopefully work with the OT residents to optimize the patient's comfort in the dental setting during hygiene appointments. As a resident, I am really excited about this collaboration between OT and dentistry, and I hope I can implement the skills and experiences from residency into practice. Well, Dr. Aya and Dr. Crystal, I just want to tell you that I am really in awe of everything that you do. Um, it really amazes me when I think of all the things that you have to consider and thinking about whether or not the patient has seizures and, you know, thinking about um, whether or not they have a dental home and where, who's going to take care of them afterwards and all the pieces that you have to put together. Um, you know, I'm really honored and thrilled that we as occupational therapists might be able to help you to make patients more comfortable um, because you're already doing an awesome job and it, it, it really, really makes me happy to think that our professions can work together in the best interest of the patients. 
Um, Dr. Dion, did you want to say anything before we finish up, before we close here? Of course, I'd like to say thank you to everyone. I'm, I'm especially proud of all of our graduate students with OT. I mean, just the mere fact that you would pick dentistry um, as your topic just warms my heart. Um, and a special thank you to Dr. Crystal and Dr. Aya for coming on at the last minute to be a part of our webinar and for doing a nice job. It's really wonderful to see you know, all of you young people on here it tells me that our population with IDDD, they're going to be okay if we could just continue working together um, for best outcomes. So thank you. And thank you to you, Dr. Tona, of course. Oh, thank you. And I, I also want to thank the occupational therapy students who uh, joined us today and who have been working really hard to make this uh, webinar what it is. And as I said last time, this is the result of many years of occupational therapy students. I think we've had over 36 OT students who've contributed in some way to this presentation. They're all listed in the online folder that we provided because I, I just can't list them all right now, but I'm really grateful to everyone who's provided um, you know, their work through the years. And of course, I want to thank University Pediatric Dentistry, who has been absolutely amazing. Um, they are a, a fantastic group to work with and really um, put the patients first. And really, it was their idea to start working with occupational therapy about, you know, eight years ago, and they have done a phenomenal job of moving forward. And now with the COVID-19 challenges, you can see that once again, they're just, their patients come first, and they're figuring out you know, how to, to do the best they can for their patients. And I also want to thank AADMD. I was not familiar with this organization um, five or six years ago. Dr. Perlman introduced me to AADMD, and I want to tell everyone there are probably people on here who weren't familiar with AADMD before this. It's a wonderful organization of professionals who really are very caring professionals and are really um, dedicated to inclusive health care. So whatever your professional background, um, I hope you consider joining AADMD. It's well worth the cost of membership. And I want to share that membership is free for students. So if you're a student watching this, just go right in and sign up. If you're a professor watching this, maybe you want to tell your students about it or require them to sign up and uh, take part in all of the wonderful uh, webinars and um, learning opportunities, leadership opportunities, and interprofessional opportunities that AADMD has to offer. Um, I do want to share that AADMD has really shown their leadership again with coronavirus. They have uh, coronavirus resources on their website for people with IDDD. Uh, they do have, um, if you page down on their website, they have COVID-19 stories uh, that you can read about. They do have a, a statement about the a vaccine statement um, for people with IDDD. So I would recommend that if you work with this population, you might want to read that statement so that you can be informed and so that you can share that uh, with families as well. And in addition, um, there is a white paper, not loading for some reason. I'm not getting to the white paper, but there is a, a white paper as well um, that's on this website. Uh, there we go. Uh, oh, you're taking it from me. <laughs> Courtney's gonna pull it up. <laughs> My computer kind of froze a little bit there. There we go. So, um, there we go. So there it, uh, is this um, ID, uh, support for individuals with IDDD. There are support guidelines there as well. And um, I also want to thank Dr. Wong, who really, um, as I said before, really urged us to put this program together. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. And um, just remind you all that if you took the pretest, you'll be receiving a post-test. Recordings from last week can be found here and handouts um, can be found at this tiny URL. I'll leave that up for a few minutes. And I'll leave that up while, for a few minutes while we answer questions. So you can uh, jot that down if you want, um, or maybe I'll put it in the chat box. So um, do we have some questions? If you want, uh, sorry. If you uh, have questions, you can enter it in the Q&A. We'll answer the questions. We'll answer as many as we can. 
and provide written responses for any questions we cannot answer tonight. So you can go ahead and put questions in the Q and A. Um, to start out with, we have one from Jennifer and she wants to know, how do you work with families who report that their child has no quote unquote special needs, even though you may be seeing behavior and other things that indicate they may? You wanna start with that Dr. Dion or? Sure, because yes, that's that question is right, directly um, related to the patient that I was uh, telling you about in the beginning and spoke about through the presentation. And that has been the struggle. Um, every, every time we meet, we provide the resources and there doesn't really seem to be a follow through on that. So the next step is going to be contacting the school, but COVID-19 hit. And so we haven't been able to reach the schools and that's not going to make a difference. I'm gonna take the advice of Dr. Tona and we're going to collaborate at this point and work together as a team. I think that will be less threatening for mom and grandma too, to know that I'm bringing in an occupational therapist to help with us. And you know, I know that once they see that we are so genuinely interested in this child and that we are, Two professionals um, saying, you know, we'll try this. Um, I think hearing from both of us that we need to get resources to have this child diagnosed will be a little bit easier than just me, the dentist. Um, that tends to happen, that they are coming to the dentist to fix the teeth and they don't realize that we really are working on the whole child. Um, and so maybe having collaboration with others will help. Dr. Tona? Yeah, I think that's great. I, I also wanna add that um, when I have a child who's not diagnosed, I always have to remember that it's not my job to diagnose them. And so, um, you know, we can talk about the behaviors that are getting in the way. So usually um, when I'm interviewing families, um, and, and I ask families about what they want for their child, they'll say, I want my child to sit still in the dental office. I want my child to be able to sit through the exam. And then we can start talking about things that might be getting in the way with that. I don't have to bring up any diagnosis. I don't have to bring up a term. You know, we can just talk about things that get in the way of kids getting through an exam. And in, in that way, it, it may be less threatening. Families may not be ready to seek any kind of diagnosis. And so, that's how I would deal with it. I would deal with what you're seeing and the realities of what you're seeing and, and not go beyond that. I, I don't know if that's helpful. I hope it is. Other questions? Um, the next one is from Anna, who wants to know who she can contact for a possible, Anna Matthews, who she can contact for a possible collaboration between OT and RDH students. She is a faculty at NYCCT, which I believe is New York City College Technology. It's the New York Institute of Technology. They have an OT program. So she can contact the OT program there. The American Occupational Therapy Association has a list. I'm thinking, um, Courtney, would we be able to send something out to all, everybody who attended? Is it possible for me to send like all of the links and then resources? Could we do that? Yes, absolutely. And um, I did put on the website um, um, all of the resources from last week's presentation. Oh, terrific. So, okay, so we will, um, we, will, we will get this out to everybody. And also the links that I showed you already, we'll get those out as well. Courtney's showing you where the links are, I think. Oh, I was, sorry. I went to the wrong one. <laughs> there we go. The links are also posted on the chat area too. Courtney did oh, that. Good. Okay, great. Terrific. So yeah, I can't like do the chat and, and actually verbally chat. So the American Occupational Therapy Association can give you, you know, you can get a list of occupational therapy programs there. Recognize that most children between the ages of birth and three in early intervention, depending on your state, most children have an occupational therapist if they have a lot of sensory problems or eating problems. And that's, those are the kids who are gonna have a lot of oral motor problems. So I would ask if they already have OT in the school 
Um, again, you, you could maybe collaborate with their school-based OT. If the family gives you permission, there, you might be able to get some, some word from the school-based OT about um, some, some ideas as well. Uh, this is a follow-up to the previous question. Um, she said they are at City Tech, uh, CUNY school, and they do have OT program. But other CUNY colleges do not have NYCC, but not NYCCT. Yeah, I know um, York College does. I would reach out to them and see if you could do something. And really with um, all of the, that we're doing with Zoom and telehealth now, you probably could have some nice interactions. I would, I would reach out to them, yeah. Other questions? I believe that's the last of them. Okay. Well, let, let me uh, just uh, come in and uh, thank you both, Dr. Tone and Dr. Wells, for a wonderful, rowdy uh, information and on, on these very inspiring young professionals to be. So proud to have the youth and the passion to help with IDD care. AADMD is all about uh, providing or trying to provide inclusive health care of which you all are helping us to educate the future professionals. So thank you for being part of that. Uh, as we said before, the recordings will be found on our websites. Last week's uh, recording, part one, is already up there, and we should hope to have the part two uh, hopefully next week. Uh, there's a lot of work that's involved, and Courtney, thank you for all you do. Um, we also have international guests here. Congratulations, wonderful job. We have uh, Dr. Abbas from Abu Dhabi, uh, and also Dr. Friedman joined us. Uh, he's from Canada, and we're very <laughs> pleased to have him. And I know Dr. Shermack returned as well, and thank you for her expertise in the field. And uh, I, I just can't say how happy I am and delighted for the information you've shared with us. We've gotten comments left and right about how wonderful the presentation is. Congratulations on uh, a wonderful job again. So on behalf of AADMD, thank you, all the students and all the residents and our panelists, Dr. Tona and Dr. Wells. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Take Bye. Care. Have a great holiday season. Bye now. <laughs>